Hi guys, we're back. Marva Muhammad, Cypress Point Elementary School, um, sixth grade ELA, and we're going on to lesson number eight. All right, uh, we are still talking about hatchet, but in this lesson, we're going to compare and contrast literary text and nonfiction text. So we know literary texts are usually novels, narrative stories, and nonfiction texts are those texts that we associate with um, facts like science and social studies, real world activities. So we're going to use Hatchet to make a comparison between what Brian is doing and whether or not he is actually following the steps to survival, okay? So before, we, uh, we've already learned how the author uses diction to develop a character, and we discussed how Gary Paulson uses diction to help us understand what Brian is doing in the text. So today we're going to read a nonfiction piece, What Would Peter Do?, by Peter Cumberfeld, and we're going to summarize some of the text. We're going to compare and contrast the advice in the nonfiction piece and the way Brian is reacting are his reactions in Hatchet. Okay, so as I read, I want you to read along and I'm going to pause, but when you read the rest, because I'm only gonna read a, a certain portion in the interest of time, I want you to make sure that you think about the main idea and what are the supporting details. Make annotations on your sticky notes about the main idea and underline those supporting details. Okay, here we go. What would Peter do? I judged his age to be about 28 or nine as he entered the room and approached me at the conclusion of one of my seminars in Portland, Oregon, some years ago. The attendees had left the room and I thought it a bit odd that someone would come in after all the seminars were over for the day. Can I help you? I asked. No, he answered. You already have. It turns out that the previous hunting season, he had driven up into Cascade Mountains east of Portland, Oregon to spend the afternoon elk hunting. Or in his words, I was just going out to see if I could shoot an elk. And in the short statement, in that short statement, in, is the nucleus of what could have become a disaster. Finding a, a likely place to begin the hunt, he parked his truck on a forest service road, grabbed his rifle, and little else, after all, he was just going out for a short afternoon hunt, and started up the hill. The higher up the hill he climbed, the deeper the snow became until he found himself walking in ankle deep snow. Cresting the ridge, he found first elk tracks Fresh, excuse me, he found fresh elk tracks in the snow. Excited, now at the possibility of actually killing an elk, he overlooked the trap that was being set. One, the weather as he left Portland on the drive into the Cascades was mild. He wouldn't need much clothing since it was only going to be a short hunt and he would be home that, that night uh, that night he didn't need to take a lot of gear. Number two, no one was available to go with him. Number three, he didn't tell anyone where he was going. Number four, he'd been in the area many times before. And number five, the vision of a freezer full of fresh, that's a tongue twister, freezer full of fresh elk meat overshadow any thoughts he might have had of a looming crisis, okay? So let's talk about that short section right there. What is the main idea of the text? So if we took the first part of the text and we summarized it, this is what we would find. So Mr. Cumberfeld or the author is telling the reader about a hunting trip that a man who visited him during 
a seminar, at the end of his seminar, went on that became dangerous. Now, we've only read the first part, so we kind of don't really know it, exactly what's going to happen, but we do have an idea that it's, it was more to it than just those five things. Those kind of set the stage. So here are some of the details that we know so far. The trip was in the Cascade Mountains of Portland, Oregon. He parked his car and took only his rifle. The snow was very deep as he walked further. It got deeper and deeper and deeper. That should have been a sign. He found fresh, or he found elk tracks and was really excited. So he followed them. And so the last key point are all these points put together is that this shows how the trap was being set or how the situation was about to turn really, really scary and deadly. So as you read, read on, there's a couple of things that I want you to take note of. So we're going to move on into some of the items that Mr. Cumberfelt, the author, talks about. And these are the survival tips that he wants the reader to understand. He says, number one, you have to accept the fact that as good as an outdoor person or woman that you are, that sometimes things can happen. Okay, that's number one. Number two, never say, I'm just, or it's only going to be, you are denying the possibility of something happening. So he wants you to really keep in mind. That's the third point. Or that's the second point. The third point is always carry the means to shelter yourself. Always have something that you can use if something turns bad, okay? Think about what Brian had when he was um, figuring out what he was gonna do for shelter. All right, number four. Prepare for the five scenarios that commonly result in a person having to spend the night out. And here are some of those things. These are the five scenarios. You might become lost, not making it back to camp or vehicle before the sun sets, becoming stranded when the vehicle that took you into the back, back country malfunctions, all right? Four, becoming ill or injured to the point that you are unable to make your own way out, and number five, when weather makes it dangerous, continue traveling. Ah, some of the things that he wants you to think about, okay? All right, the next one of the survival tips, he says, don't let the concerns of others or what they might be thinking about because you're gone hinder you from surviving. Never think about what's going on with your family or friends. When you're away, you have to focus on your own survival, okay? Number six, always tell someone where you're going. That's very important. That's the most important of all the ones. To me, that seems like the most important because if something happens, someone knows where you are, okay? Number seven, be ready to deal with fear and panic that usually results when you're confronted in a crisis. Now. How did Brian deal with his fear? In chapter five, he panics and then brings himself back to what he needed to do. Remember what Mr. Perpich told him? You've got to stay on top of things. You've got to get motivated. That's something to remember. Number eight, keep faith in yourself and your ability to survive, okay? So with all of that information, you're going to take what we've learned from the text, and we're gonna compare to see if Brian was actually able to do just that, okay? All right, so let's take a look at our handout, What Would Peter Do, Graphic Organizer. All right, so let's look. So in your, in your document, these are some of the ones, we're gonna do the first three together and then I'll allow you to do the rest on your own. So it says, on one side you have advice from what would Peter do? On the other side it says evidence from the text and of course this is what Brian is doing. So we're gonna to try to see if Brian is actually doing what he 
should be doing, even though he doesn't really have all of the prerequisite knowledge, you know, that means he doesn't have all the answers. He's kind of figuring it out. Okay. So the first one says, and we read it, it says, except that you will have to cope with difficult challenges. That was the first one. Okay. So in the text, it says, so he almost jumped with the word. He realizes this is the part where, you know, we wrote down in our annotations that he actually is talking to himself. This was the words annotation. He says he almost jumped with the word spoken aloud. It seemed so out of place. The sound. He tried it again. So. So here I am. And there it is. He thought for the first time since the crash, his mind started to work. His brain triggered and began thinking. That's in chapter five. OK. All right. Let's look at number two. Do not deny the possibility that something can go wrong. All right. So in the text, it says, uh, and on his belt, somehow still there, we know what that was, the hatchet his mother had given him. He had forgotten it and now reached around and took it out and put it in the grass, along with all the other items. Remember, he had the money, he had the wallet, and he had the, the nail clippers. And so the hatchet was right there with him. All right, number three. Always carry means for shelter, fire, and to attract attention. All right, so we know that Brian was, when he got on the plane, he saw, we'll, we'll, we'll read it, it says, Brian was riding up from New York with some drilling equipment. It was latched down in the rear of the plane next to a fabric bag. Uh, the pilot had called a survival pack, which had an emergency supply, had emergency supplies in it, in the case, that had to make an emergency, just in case they had to make an emergency landing. It's all the way down at the bottom. Sorry about that. Okay, so that's, that was in chapter one. So he knew that there was something um, on the plane that could help him survive. All right. So here's the question. Given that situation in the wilderness with an emergency. Did Brian follow the advice offered and what would Peter do? So when you are completing your graphic organizer, you're going to go back and look at the last, I think the last four and see if Brian is actually following those guidelines, even though he doesn't actually have a survival manual with him. He's sort of going along trying to figure it all out. So, concluding, in this lesson, you learned that some Brian's reactions and decisions are in line with your survival advice from an expert, and some are not. So when you're finishing up, you'll see just exactly which one he didn't actually follow. All right, and we also practice comparing and contrasting text evidence and literary and non-literary text. So see you next lesson, guys.